Well, <laughs> what do I say? Um, it's not only a great honour to have been invited um, to address to you here today, uh, but to have been introduced by Joan, um, and, in, and in the terms in which she introduced me is um, uh, quite stunning, quite quite humbling, and I do thank you very much, Joan. We've known each other for many, many years, and uh, uh, went, while she was talking, I was just trying to think, well, what, what were some of the key moments in, in our, our long association and friendship? And, and uh, I guess there were two um, meetings or events that, that really stick out in my memory of, of many that I could mention. Uh, but one of them was, um, I think, I, again, I can't, I'm not sure of the date. But hey, I, yay! <laughs> I, I, think, I think it was about 1990, I'm not sure, but I was living in New York and um, Joan was Premier and um, she was um, hosting the Victorian Premier's Literary Awards, so her, her Literary Awards, and she invited me to come from New York to um, deliver the speech at the dinner to, at which these awards were, were um, given. And I was very impressed by the fact that I was sitting next to her at the dinner. I was very impressed by the fact that she had read every single one of the books that had been nominated. And I doubt that very many premiers, I mean, all the premiers have literary awards. I don't think many of them read all the books. So that was um, very impressive. And the second time, I, second thing I remember is, um, Joan's already alluded to the fact that, you know, when I was working for Paul Keating, when he was prime minister and she was premier, and I went to see her in her office one day and um, I thought, you know, we're, we're old mates, you know, feminists in the trenches, you know, we'll just sit down and sort things out. No way. You know, I was in the feds. She was the state premier. I was the enemy. <laughs> I, got, I got spoken to very, very strictly um, and, and told about, you know, I was just a, a, a minder, of a staffer, and uh, put, put very much in my place. So uh, we're back on a more even keel now. <laughs> <laughs> we're both we're both out of politics. That's right. No, no. As much as much as as much yeah. as we ever can be. Stuff, yeah. um, last week in the Australian newspaper, the columnist Janet Albrechtson mm. described me as an ageing activist. She meant it as an insult. I, I wonder, I wonder which bit of ageing activist <laughs> I'm meant to be insulted by. Is it? I'm just going to take my jacket off. It's a bit warm in here. Um, I'm wondering which bit I'm meant to be insulted by. Is it the ageing bit or is the activist bit? Neither are insulting because both are true. Although I think I would prefer to call myself an ancient warrior. Somehow it sounds nobler. A combination of the ancient mariner and the Greenpeace flagship, the rainbow warrior. Either way, as someone who took part in her first political action in 1965, I remember I joined a a small delegation of students and we went and called on the Minister for Education in Adelaide. I can't remember what we wanted, but I remember we, um, we got in to see him and, and we had our photographs in the paper. But as somebody who, um, who engaged in her first bit of action in 1965, I can scarcely deny that I'm now 45 years older than I was then. Mm -hmm. Nor can I claim to have hung up my protest weapons, although they have changed somewhat over the years. I sometimes think it would be nice to sit back and uh, let, injustice, let the injustices of the world pass me by. But I'm not that sort of person. When I see something wrong, I want to do something about it. Today, I want to reflect on the... <laughs> but wait, there's more. <laughs> Today, I want to reflect on some of the changes we made happen over the past few decades. I want especially to look at the changes that improved women's opportunities and hence enabled them and us to take a measure of control over our lives. I want to start by looking back a generation, going back to 1975. That was International Women's Year, the year that galvanised many women in this country into action. And if I can just give you a quick snapshot of that era, uh, the figures I'm going to give you up weren't necessarily from 1975 because I couldn't find them strictly comparable ones, but they're all from the early 70s. In 1972, women were just 32% of university students. In 1973, women comprised 33% of the workforce and around 57% of women in the workforce were married. And one of the things that was very striking about the early 70s is it was just uh, a few years uh, from the lifting of the marriage bar. Do any of you remember the marriage bar? Which meant that women in the public service, in the teaching profession and in the banks weren't allowed to be employed in permanent positions once they were married. Not even when they were, had children, but they were just married. So when that marriage bar was finally lifted in 1967, that led to a huge surge in the employment of, of, um, 
the participation rate of married women. In 1972, the Conciliation and Arbitration Commission awarded women equal pay for equal work, formally ending the 25% legislated disparity between men's and women's wages. This decision meant that teachers, for instance, and journalists were to be paid the same, regardless of sex. And in 1974, women were awarded an equal minimum wage to be phased in over two years. The pill, the contraceptive pill, had been put on the PBS just two years earlier, in December 1972, by the newly elected Whitlam government as one of its very first acts. I think it was on day three that Whitlam did that. It was an act which was to, be, to greatly reduce the cost of oral contraceptives and thus make it far more widely available. Although abortion was still on the criminal statutes in most states, both Victoria and New South Wales had legally sanctioned abortion as a result of two judicial rulings, the Levine in New South Wales and the Manhattan ruling down here in Victoria. There was just one woman in the House of Representatives and only four in the Senate. In the election in December 1975, uh, the, that year, the year, uh, the, the election that followed the dismissal of the Whitlam government, two more women, including Senator, uh, Susan Ryan, who would be Labor's first cabinet minister, woman cabinet minister, minister, would both be elected to the Senate. But Joan Child, who was the only woman in that lower house, lost her seat. So there were no women. There were no women at all in Gough Whitlam's ministry. South Australia introduced sex discrimination legislation, the country's first. The federal government provided only minimal funding for childcare. So that was sort of the early 70s. That was sort of what it was like. But apart from these stats, it's worth remembering a few of the cultural, a few of the elements of the cultural landscape of the time. You hardly saw a woman of authority on television. Women could not read the news because their voices were considered to be too highly pitched and no one would take seriously what they read. On the other hand, women, women were considered to be the only ones who could read the, who could read the weather and they had to do it wearing bikinis. <laughs> so when we compare our lives today with what it was like then, we have to acknowledge that the changes have been profound. Women are everywhere, and where they are absent, say, from the boards of the top ASX-listed companies, this is now a source of complaint. So to quickly compare the stats of the 1970s, today, women are now a majority of students and graduates from university. Women are 45.6% of the workforce, with a labour force participation rate of 58.8%, which is higher than it used to be, but still well below that of women in comparable economies. And in 2001, 57% of women with children under 12 were in, the work were in the workforce. Today, there are 68 women in federal parliament, comprising 27.3% of the House of Reps and 35.5% of the Senate. Quite a difference. Uh, I should say to you that, uh, that in the remarks I'm making to you today, there are quite a lot of figures, and I, I, I don't apologise for that because I find that people like to get this information, but it might be a little difficult to listen to. Um, but the speech will be on my website uh, by tomorrow, I hope, so you can get them all there, so don't worry if you miss out on one of them. Um, so there have been these incredible changes. Things are very, very different, but we're still not there. In many respects, we've gone backwards from where we were in the 1980s, which was the decade of what I call the Great Leap Forward for women in Australia. I think we can characterise the past 40 years for women in terms of the political leadership of the time. The Whitlam era was brief, but it saw an avalanche of change. The position of a women's advisor was created, the pill was made cheaper, childcare was funded, anti-discrimination legislation was introduced but not passed because of the untimely dismissal of the government. The Hawke-Keating era saw huge progress for women. Sex, discrimina sex discrimination and affirmative action legislation, massive expansion of childcare places, and a rebate to help with the costs. Women's advisory bodies in every federal department and the Women's Budget Program, to name just some. The Howard era saw women's equality stall and in many respects go backwards. As uh, Joan has mentioned, uh, my book, The End of Equality, uh, explains in some detail how John Howard used policy quite ruthlessly to achieve his ideological goal of encouraging mothers to stay out of the workforce. He downgraded the Office of the Status of Women. He reduced the Sex Discrimination Commissioner's powers. He abolished the Women's Bureau and all of the de departmental advisory bodies 
and he encouraged the privatisation of childcare with disastrous results, witness the ABC learning debacle. The Rudd era so far has been disappointing. There are four women in Cabinet. The childcare rebate was increased to 50% and gender pay equity is legislated for in the Fair Work Act. But the Office of the Status of Women remains in the welfare area rather than the political powerhouse of Prime Minister and Cabinet where it belongs. The administrative arrangements overall for women's policy are fractured and illogical. Uh, EOA, the uh, Employ Equal Opportunities for Women and Workplace Agency, has been dumped from the employment portfolio and put into welfare, an inexplicable move. EOA has been recently reviewed, um, but so far nothing has happened. A large number of us are involved in submissions and consultations around that review a strong view emerged that the government should upgrade EOA and give it greater powers. Both the Henry Review and the Budget have passed without any indication of the government's response to these views. All that Tanya Plibersek, the Minister for the Status of Women, will say is that the government will announce its response soon. The government recently betrayed us on childcare when it announced the cancellation of 260 centres that were to be built in school grounds to help end the double drop-off. The paid parental leave scheme is better than nothing, but falls far short of being equitable and will leave some women worse off. There are fewer women heads of department in Canberra than there were under Howard. There will be fewer Labor MPs after the federal election this year. A year ago, I gave another speech in Melbourne this time to the Victorian Premier's Women's Summit, the last time I saw Joan, in fact. And in that speech, I talked about the GFC, the Gender Fairness Crisis. I want to talk about it again today, because while Australia might have emerged relatively unscathed from the global financial crisis, the Gender Fairness Crisis is actually worsening, particularly when it comes to women's pay. In Victoria in 2009, on average, women earned 83.4 cents for every dollar earned by men. There had been only a marginal improvement in the past quarter century with the Australia-wide gap narrowing from 18.5% in May 1984 to 17.4% in May 2009. So over 25 years, uh, we uh, improved the gender gap by 1%. I remember that in 1984, when I was the head of the Office of the Status of Women, I used to go around the country giving speeches about how wonderful the government was and all the fabulous things we were doing. I used to quote this figure of saying that the women's gender pay gap, I don't think we actually used that term then, but I said the difference in women's pay was um, 18, uh, that women were earning about 83 cents uh, for every dollar earned by men. And I, 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 I described this in very positive terms because I said, well, only a few years earlier, uh, it was 67 cents in the dollar. And so we've gone from 67 cents to 83 cents in, in less than 10 years. And I assumed that the trajectory would just keep on going at the same rate and that um, we would have closed the gap by now. Um, I was wrong. We know that the pay gap starts from the moment women leave university, with female graduates earning on average $2,000 a year less than male graduates. When it comes to the professions, women are far worse off. A House of Representatives inquiry into pay equity last year heard evidence that women lawyers are among the least fairly treated of all women. Although 56% of law graduates are women, by the time they are aged 40, only 25% of Australia's practising lawyers are women. One reason for the drop-off is the appalling gap in earnings. Women lawyers suffer a 62% pay gap, and it starts in the first year. The Law Council of Australia has revealed that in 2007, in New South Wales, male graduates were paid 70300 while women received only 63500 This earnings gap is entrenched right at the start and continues to widen the longer women stay in the professions. Is it any wonder that women lawyers get discouraged and leave? And it seems that the higher up you go in an organisation, the worse the pay discrimination is. A 2006 report from EOA revealed that women CEOs receive only 67% of male CEOs' salaries, while chief financial officers are even worse done by 
getting just 49% of the salaries of their male counterparts. But the most startling statistic of all is the one that tells us that in Australia, in 2010, there is a million dollar penalty to being a woman. Recent research shows that if current earning patterns continue, the average 25-year-old male starting work today will earn $2.4 million over the next 40 years, while the average 25-year-old female will earn $1.5 million. So over a lifetime of working, a woman will, all, will earn almost $1 million less than a man. So how fair is that? The consequences of this gender pay divide is that women not only have less money than men during their working lives, but they are two and a half times more likely to live in poverty in their old age than men. How fair is that? We have a gender fairness crisis. Across the board, women lag when it comes to occupying leadership positions and are disadvantaged in almost every area of Australian life. This disadvantage is summed up in um, Gender Equity Stats 2009, which is a terrific document produced by um, Elizabeth Broderick, the Sex Discrimination Commissioner, and you can get it on her website. Uh, she published that to mark the 25th anniversary of the Sex Discrimination Act last year. Australia ranks 17 in the Global Gender Gap Index, according to the document, and women's representation at all levels of leadership, state and federal, private and public sectors, is low and falling. Women are also more prone to be victims of violence, to suffer sexual assaults, and to be pitifully provided for when it comes to retirement. The compounded effect of reduced earnings means that women's economic well-being will deteriorate as they get older. We know that women managers, earning, women managers' earnings tend to stagnate when they reach their 40s, yet women are likely to work well into their 60s. Women's superannuation is already much lower than men's, and this gap will increase markedly as the gender pay gap widens. The Queensland Government has calculated that by 2019, on average, women will have half the amount of superannuation that men have. Today, half of all women aged between 45 and 59 have $8,000 or less in superannuation. This means that despite the vast increase in women's workforce participation, their reduced earnings mean that many women will face old age in penury. At present, the average superannuation payout for men is 110,000, compared with 37,000 for women. This is another indicator of the gender fairness crisis in this country. The third reason for concern about the widening gap in women's earnings is what it means for women's status generally. It must be the mark of the low status of women that such discrimination does exist and can persist. Despite the existence of state and federal agencies that are meant to monitor women's status, the Human Rights Commission, EOA, the Office for Women, to name just a few, despite the fact that there have been numerous parliamentary inquiries in recent years into various aspects of women's status, and despite constant findings by all these bodies that inequality and discrimination exist, nothing is done. Nothing happens. In fact, things are getting worse again. As of February this year, this is, these are um, figures that were only released last week, uh, and they refer to the Australian Bureau of Stats statistics collected in February this year, which show that women on average earned 18% less than men. This was 1.5% less than they had earned a year earlier. In other words, while women earned around 83.5 cents for every dollar earned by men last year, this year their earnings have dropped back to 82 cents. That's lower than it was in 1984. Equal Pay Day this year will be on September 4, three days later than it was in 2009. Equal Pay Day, as I'm sure you all know, is an initiative of EOWA. It's the day on which women's pay catches up with men's. In 2010, women have to work an extra 66 days in order to earn the same amount as men. Now, if we drill down into these pay figures, there are some even, there are some even more alarming things. The gender pay gap in the private sector is 21.7%, compared with 12.1% in the public sector. It's 29.3% in the financial and insurance services sector, which is perhaps not surprising, 
uh, in that testosterone fueled world. But I was surprised, and I suspect you will be too, to learn that in the healthcare and social assistance sector, the one where I suspect many of you are employed, the gender pay disparity is 29%. Did you know that? Given that the overwhelming majority of, of the employees in this sector are women, this figure suggests that the men who work in this sector are paid very handsomely indeed. I suppose that will be because although this is a female dominated sector, it's still largely run by men. It turns out that if you want equal pay or something approaching it in Australia in 2010, you had better go to work in transport, postal and warehousing, where the gender pay gap is only 6.5%. I find it sad that 40 years after equal pay was first legislated in this country, not only is there still a gender pay gap, but that it's widening. I now want to share with you a new form of activism that I'm about to embark upon. It is one that I think will be of interest to many of you because I understand that you've been doing workshops on how to do online fundraising. And my new initiative is a related activity. It involves the book that I published in 1975 and which many people tell me had a profound effect on them. I was blamed for marriages breaking up. I was also given credit, far more than I actually deserve, for women finding the courage to follow their dreams, which in some cases meant leaving marriages that had been contracted on the basis of inequality. I'm referring, of course, to Damned Whores and God's Police, which Joan's already mentioned. My first book and the one of which I'm still the most proud. I continue to be amazed at how often people still talk to me about that book and tell me how it helped them in their lives. Only last week I was contacted by Shirley Walker, who's a wonderful woman who's the author of a fantastic book which I really, really recommend you all read called The Ghost at the Wedding. Shirley and I were uh, on a panel together at Sydney Writers Festival and she got in touch with me afterwards. It was great to meet you again, she said in, in, in an email, and I'm so pleased you met my daughter Brenda, and her daughter Brenda Walker is also an author, and Brenda has just published an absolutely stunning book called Reading by Moonlight. Mm -hmm. Have you, do you know that book, John? Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful book about Brenda's account of the solace she received from reading while she was treated for breast cancer. Absolutely extraordinary book. Anyway, Shirley, her mother said, I'm so pleased you met my daughter Brenda. She is of the generation which grew up with damned whores and God's police. You are a much loved and respected figure to them, and of course to my colleagues and myself who used and appreciated it as a teaching text. I'm sure Shirley won't mind me telling you that she's in her 80s. Now, her age is relevant only to illustrate that this book has been read by and had an influence on people across a very wide span of ages. Over the past three decades, I've become accustomed to people of my generation telling me what the book meant to them. But in recent years, I've been both startled and gratified to hear younger people telling me that their mothers studied it at university and that they themselves read it at school. Soon I expect I'll have even younger people telling me that their grandmothers read it. But it's not so easy for this young generation to read it themselves. In fact, I was contacted just two days ago by a young woman who says she wants to become a feminist writer and researcher and wanted to read the book, but was frustrated because she could no longer find a copy. Two years ago, Penguin Books decided it no longer wanted to keep damned whores in print. It had had a good innings. It was continuously in print for 33 years. So I like to say I lasted as long as Jesus. Uh, <laughs> But, but I have to admit, I was disappointed, and I was puzzled. After all, people were still buying it, still talking about it. The book had been judged just in 2003 as one of the 10 books that had shaped sociological discourse in Australia by the Australian Sociological Association. They gave me a little thing, a little plastic thing, to commemorate it. So why would you take it out of print? If Penguin can keep the lucky country in print all these years, why not damned whores? Was this another example of women and women's perspectives being overlooked and ignored? Whatever the reason, I decided to take control of the situation. I got the rights back from Penguin and began to look at how I might keep the book alive in some form or another. And what I want to share with you today is an exciting new venture that is very much in the spirit of the kinds of projects that many of you are already involved with or a planning. 
I had thought that I could perhaps publish Damned Whores as an e-book and take my chances in the brave new digital world. But then I met Sarah Taylor, my friend Sarah, who's sitting up, where are you, Sarah? Sitting over there somewhere. And Sarah came up with a much better idea. And what I'm about to tell you has not yet been publicly announced, but there are still, because there are still a few elements, uh, elements of it that are um, being fine-tuned. But we are hoping to launch in July an initiative which we call W4W. Now, W4W stands for Words for Women. It's an Australian-based global initiative that is designed to use the sale of women's words to empower women in Indigenous communities in Australia and women entrepreneurs in the Asia-Pacific region. This is how it will work. W4W will connect women's storytelling with online methods of transfer and monetary exchange, creating a new force, promoting and providing practical support to the global economic advancement of women. It will kick off with my donation of the copyright of Damned Whores and God's Police, which will be the first of a number of books by prominent women which will be available for sale in digital form. The proceeds... Wait, there's more. The proceeds of these sales will then be distributed by W4 Women, W4, sorry, W4W, still getting used to saying it, to women entrepreneurs in the form of micro loans. We hope to work in partnership with IWDA, that stellar Melbourne based organisation, to identify women in need of loans to develop businesses. We will also work with an online delivery mechanism such as Kiva to get the money to the women and to enable donors to track the use to which their funds are being put. The idea is that my book, Damned Horse and God's Police, God's Police, will continue to do what it has always done, to inform and inspire people, especially women, in ways that might help them towards more independent lives. But it will be linked to a very practical philanthropic activity that will have the potential to totally transform the lives of really disadvantaged women. Sarah and I see W4W as a virtuous circle, whereby each participant in the process receives and creates value for the next participant. I see W4W as, creating, as giving expression to my belief that self-respect is central to the global advancement of women. When women attain self-respect, it leads to their being respected by others. They are respected for their achievements and for, them, and for themselves. We all know how important economic security is to self-respect. If we are dependent on others, it erodes our confidence and disempowers us. Economic self-sufficiency, on the other hand, empowers us and gives us that self-respect that is the foundation on which so much else rests. We all know the stories of how microcredit has transformed the lives of women in developing countries and how these transformations have helped families and whole villages. W4W, Words for Women, proposes to provide another example of this, but with one crucial difference. The money will come from women writers donating their words to empower other women. The stories women tell, the words we write, the culture we share, the businesses we create can all be linked together in a powerful stream of change. And it can be achieved in ways that women have always connected by gathering together and sharing our stories, supporting and guiding one another with wisdom. I propose to invite leading women writers from around the world to do donate their intellectual property, their IP, of at least one of their works for a specified time to Words for Women. During that time, the proceeds of selling these works will be used by Words for Women to empower less privileged women. We're often criticised for being cushy Western feminists who do nothing to help really disadvantaged women in developing countries. We hope that Words for Women will be a thriving example of women, in this case women writers, of the first world using their privilege in a very practical and realistic way. We will start small, but intend to build Words for Women into a global philanthropic venture that will include the words of some of the world's best known women. Gloria Steinem springs to mind. 
We will start by facilitating loans to Australian women, but as we grow, we will expand our loan facilities to women in developing countries, especially in this region. We already have great interest from several potential partners, but while we grow, we also need a visionary person or foundation to underwrite us, and we are hoping that one or more of you here today might wish to be involved. Next year marks the 100th birthday of International Women's Day, and we plan to use that day, March the 8th, to hold a very special event involving Words for Women. If you want more information, please speak to Sarah or me today, or else check out my website, which is just ansummers.com.au, and where I'll be posting regular updates. Words for Women represents a different form of activism from the kind I was involved with in 1965. As I look back over the years, I see that I have been active in the women's movement, the anti-war movement, the environmental movement, in government and in NGOs. Lately, I've begun working with business, as it is there, rather than with government, where the action for improving women's employment opportunities currently lie. It's interesting to observe the changing ways of changing the world, but that is the subject of a whole other talk. For now, I'll conclude by thanking you for inviting me here today and for listening to the words of an ancient warrior. Thank you.